Please join me in prayer. Powerful and mighty God, we, your people, come this morning dry and thirsty, feeling as though it's been so long since we felt the refreshment of your presence. We see the world around us and we are distressed, distressed by the lack, by the loneliness, by the violence, by the hatred that surrounds us. Lord, it is the, as though we live in a desert where there is no moisture from your love. This morning we ask that you renew in our minds and in our hearts our baptism. We ask that you remind us of the sensation of being surrounded by your love. Bring us back to the moments in our lives when we have known you there clearly. Focus our hearts on the times when we have had our fill and been able to even have more of you. In these moments, Lord, we are your people. We know your forgiveness, your wholeness, and your health for the nations. But we admit that these moments seem fleeting to us. We come now to anchor ourselves in your love. Be for us the water of life, now and forever. Amen. Well, it is the Sunday in the church here where we get to think about the baptism of Jesus. We do this every year. Really, it was supposed to be last Sunday because we had to do a epiphany. It gets all messed up. Should have had an extra service or something, I guess. But we hear the story of Jesus and John together in the wilderness out there, <clears throat> hanging out with the locusts and the honey and all that good stuff, right? And there were several options that I could have chosen to preach about with this text. In fact, I got a whole file of them. Got a whole file of them. Options. I must have written you five sermons this week. Yeah, it's going to be a real short sermon. I promise. With this text, I could have preached you a really nice sermon about how you should remember the importance of your baptism. I got it right here. You should remember the importance of your baptism. Uh-huh. And how you need to seal that in your heart and feel God's grace for you pouring over you like the waters of the baptism and how you should hear God saying to you, you are my beloved child, with you I am pleased. You know what, I think I preached that last year, though. Y'all nod. Yes, Susanna, you preached that last year. I might have even preached it the year before that. No. I think you might have heard that before. And you know what else I, I don't like about that sermon is it asks you to identify yourself in the story as Jesus. I'm not feeling really Jesus-y today. I had this drive in this morning, and there was this guy on the road. In front. Who thought that it was Sunday and he could drive 15 miles an hour on Normandy, and I was like, this is a 55, I swear. <laughs> I'm not feeling very Jesus-y today. You know what? This sermon, 
sermon. It's just, it's not going to do for today. I've gone over it. <laughs> you wait now? Okay, good. I could have preached to you about the identity of Jesus. I could have focused on how he's our Messiah and how John calls him the Lamb of God. I'm turning towards Christmas, though. And, you know, we talked about all those names that we ascribe to Jesus. We talked about that for five weeks. Five weeks of the name of Jesus. You want to do another week of it, right? Yeah. Yeah, all right. It feels a little redundant. You know what? I got that sermon right here, too. Right here. Personhood of Jesus. <laughs> she can't mind. reach that. <laughs> And I can say to you all the many ways that Jesus came for us and filled so many needs in our lives. But you know what? If I told you that sermon, we'd be outsiders in this story. We'd be sitting nice and comfortable in these pews, thinking about who Jesus is. We wouldn't have, like, a part in the story. I think we're part of the story. You know what? I'm not preaching that sermon. <laughs> ah! <laughs> oh, <laughs> pastor's got to work out. <laughs> I could have preached to you about the Gospel of John and how it's different from the other Gospels. I could have talked to you about the importance of seeing Jesus as holy divine and what it means to us that he came. I could have talked to you about following the theology of John, about how a how holy Jesus is. That might have been a decent sermon. You know, I got it right here. <laughs> that would have been a good sermon. I could have followed that path. But you know what? If, I, if we did that, we'd be aligning ourselves in the story with the gospel writer's first audience. That's not so bad, really. It's important to see things the way they saw them. It would have been a smart sermon. Might have been an A-plus sermon. But you know what? You guys don't actually like it when I preach A-plus sermons. They get boring. And it would have been all splitting hairs and defining words. Fine distinctions. Sometimes it feels to me like the grace of God present in Jesus isn't about splitting hairs. You know, I'm not preaching this one either. <laughs> 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 Is exactly. 
exactly what I'm looking for. I just want to sit and be sung to. Thank you very much. I just want to hear it, you know. And some Sundays I come and I'm just so anxious to see all my friends. And I want to gather around you people and hug you. And I want to tell stories and I want to laugh. And I want to tell you about the crazy thing that happened at the supermarket the other day. Sometimes I come just for that. I mean, not just for that. I come and that's what I'm yearning for. And you know, then there's the potluck dinners. And all those pork chops. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? I mean, I'm not saying I come just for cupcakes and, and pork chops. God knows I don't come for the pork chops. But, you know, I mean, it doesn't hurt, right? It doesn't hurt getting me motivated to come to church when I know there will be a cupcake in my future. That isn't why we're here, is it? I mean, we keep coming back. But guys could buy cupcakes at the grocery store. <gasps> Maybe it's because of the world. The world is a scathing, scratchy, teeming, scheming, feuding, looting. I made up that word, by the way. I like it too. Looting. Hairy, horrible place. And yet we love it. We love it because people need church. We love it because we're told to love it and we learn how to love it here. It's hard living in this world. You know what? It hurts. The world hurts us a lot of the time. People hurt us. People can be hateful and insensitive and selfish. I hope I'm not, you know, bursting your bubble here. If that's not your experience, talk to me after. I want to hear all about it. The world can be a hard place to live. And sometimes I crawl into this sanctuary like I'm going to the nurse's station and I just need some band-aids. Just need a little neosporin on those spots that have been bumped around. <clears throat> I think it's not just the treatment, though. I think it's the feeling of hope that it will be better, that it can be better, that brings me in. We're healed here. We're free here. We're tuned in to a melody of love. <clears throat> it's the hope that it will be different. Hope that Jesus will meet us and change everything. In the text, the would-be disciples answer Jesus with another question. They say, where are you staying, Jesus? It's like they're saying, we're looking for you, dude. You're the one we came to see. And we were thinking if it was all right with you, we'd like to hang out for a while, make a box of macaroni and cheese, I don't know, maybe play a hand of cards or two, and then, you know, we watch something on Netflix. I hear House of Cards is amazing. Where are you staying, Jesus? Show us that so we can understand how to be at home with you. And Jesus says to them, come and see. And we sit here in a church building. It's a building. It's not anything super awesomely sacred. When they put these walls together, they didn't bless them with some kind of magic. But it has a kind of magic, doesn't it? Because we call this place the house of God. Because we know that in this place, we can come and be comfortable and take our shoes off. That is not an invitation to take your shoes off. Some of you should not do that. But we can come be at home with God in this place, right? It's not that it's, you know, like we have to put on our, our Sunday best and, and like we're visiting our parents' bosses or something. It's like we can be comfortable here. 
And that was the purpose we had when we established this place. We come to be intimately involved in the life of Christ. And by God's grace, we are. As we read this text, we find that John has written this for people who don't need any spoiler alerts. Right? They seem to know how this story ends at the beginning, just like we do. They know that Jesus is the Lamb of God, and that means that he will be a sacrifice for us. Just like we already know what happens to Jesus at the end of the story. That he will overcome the forces of death. We are like John's readers. You know what? I guess I got to redeem that sermon I, I threw at you, Sharon. You got that over there? No? I was hoping you'd throw it back to me. That's ah, all right. I got to redeem that sermon because apparently it is about John, about the scripture from John and what it means. We don't even know ourselves apart from Jesus, saving love for us. Do you remember what it was like before you heard about Jesus? <clears throat> Good morning. Do you remember? No. Most of us don't. Most of us don't remember what it was like before we heard about Jesus. And those of us who do remember, those are some lucky people, because they've got some stories to tell. When we choose to come and see, the thing that we see changes us forever. Whatever else we say about him, Jesus' presence in our lives changes us. Being a follower of Jesus changes everything. It redeems us, it heals us, it makes us whole, it gives us hope, it fills us with his grace. Ah, his identity is our wholeness. Darn it, where's that sermon on the identity of Jesus? You guys got that back there? Jennifer, you threw it back a row. Ah, that's all right, it's not lost, it's all in my head. We'll just redeem it. Iron it out. And you know what? <coughs> that sermon about baptism, we need that one too. Because it does change us. You gonna throw it back to me? <laughs> Valentine went to the Orensky School of Throwing. <laughs> does make a difference. It changes who we are on the inside. When we come and we see we are part of the story of God's redemptive work, our part of the story is woven into the larger tapestry. We can't even see how it all works out, but we know that God is moving the parts of the weaving loom, putting the shuttle through, Picking out the threads to create the pattern that will be the beautiful witness of God's story. Uh oh, wait a minute. Hmm. You guys, there's an evangelism sermon in here. <laughs> <laughs>
All right, put your seatbelts on. Hmm. It looks like the end of the sermon is the evangelism sermon. Jesus' invitation to his disciples was easygoing. Low pressure. He didn't walk up to anybody and bump them on the head with the Bible. You've met those people, right? My favorite was, do you believe in ultimate truth? Oh. <laughs> um, I believe that the letters that form those words exist. And sure, if there's truth, I <laughs> ultimate truth. Jesus didn't have to draw that diagram with the pit and then the cross that goes across. You know what I mean? Jesus didn't have to use any gimmicks to invite these people into relationship. Didn't have to do any fancy dances. Didn't have to have an awesome praise band with drum set and hands in the air. Woo, woo, woo. I mean, you know, if he wanted to, he could have. Didn't need any of that. All he said was, come and see. Come and see, because the power of God is enough once we've encountered it. Intimacy with God is enough when we see it, when we share it, we share it in Christ's life. But I wonder, I wonder if the presence of Jesus in our lives is the most salient fact about who we are. See, all right, here's the thing. Our love for Jesus changes everything. And a true Christian becomes that moment of encounter with Christ. Becomes only fully knowable in the sharing of that knowledge of Christ. Being a Jesus follower means that the most important thing to know about you is that you are a Jesus follower. I mean, sure, you guys are really cute. You have some interesting hobbies, and you read good books. You love your kids, and you take care of people. Those are all important things, but None of those things are actually separate from the fact that you love Jesus. <clears throat> I like to put it in a little sidecar, carry it along down the road of life with us and pretend like we can just keep our Jesus loving over there. <clears throat> but it's really more like a VW van, if you know what I mean. Jesus loving. Once you're in a VW van, there's no not being in the van. You can't, like, cool yourself out of being in a VW van. You can't look aloof driving down the road and be like, you know, hey, what's up to the driver next door? And they'll look at you, and the first thing they'll think is, that person's in a VW van. <laughs> Being a Jesus follower is like that. You've got to get in the van. But once you're in it, you've got to accept that that's the most important thing people are going to see about you. You know, if you're like me, you may go through life and have a lot of superficial relationships with people. People who you're friendly enough with, but you kind of hold them at arm's length. You don't let them know your heart. You know, the guy across the street. Hey, Brad, how you doing? Wow, your garden looks great. Good to see you. Have a great day. Bye. Brad doesn't know what's in my heart. Probably knows more of the stuff I don't want him to know, like how I'm late every single Sunday morning. <laughs> but when you invite people to come and see, to know your heart for Christ, to know what God is doing in your life, then they get to truly know you in a new and intimate way. 
Yeah, that's right. I just told you that if you're not sharing your faith journey with your friends, they don't know you yet. They don't know the most important thing about you. And that makes you kind of sad, doesn't it? Makes me kind of sad. I want people to know what I'm passionate about, what I love, what changes me. Are you keeping Christ in your life a secret? Now, I imagine you saying over and over to people, come and see what God is doing in my life. Sit with me a while so I can share the realest thing about me with you. You see, my friend, you don't really know me until you know about what Jesus is doing with me. Come and see. Let's pray. Loving God, you have claimed to us, and yet we resist being holy, your people. We forget that our lives are yours, and that nothing about us can be separated from our love for you, and more importantly, for your love for us. Ground us in the truth that loving you is the most important thing about us. We thank you, Lord, that you have invited us to come and see what you are doing in the world. We ask you to inspire in us an attitude of gratitude that allows others to see as well. May the invitation be ever on our lips. In Jesus' name.